Welcome back to the Double Egg. I'm one half of the show. Hey, Jai Picks, the other half of the show, the parlay. Joining me in to break down UFC 299. Absolutely stacked car. We'll be there in attendance. We do the show every week. Sometimes, not going to lie, it's a little rough going through these cards. But this card, <laughs> I'm so excited to go through this card and uh, hear your thoughts. And of course, hear the thoughts of the viewers here. Thank you for tuning in. Drop a subscription to support the Homo Fight channel. We're going to go through every single fight, 14 fights in total. Break them down individually. If we have a pick, we'll give you a pick. Some of these I got some bias on, so I'm going to make that clear. Um, but we're going to go through and break them down nonetheless. And of course, if you want all the bets, you can jump in the Hype Picks Discord. Link is down in the description for that. But what do you think of the card overall? The best card of the year, obviously. Everybody's talking about it. Just one of those cards, top to bottom, it is going to be a lot of fun. I mean, we're starting out with Joanne Wood uh, and Morose, which is like, eh, you know, maybe a pregame a little bit longer before the fights, and then show up for CJ Vergara versus Asu Almabayev. So from then on, though, dude, it gets crazy. Robles to Spain, uh, Jan Kudalaba. I mean, there's a lot of exciting, exciting fighters. Like I said, Jan Kudalaba, Mich Michelle Pereira, and Mikal Alizacek. Kyler Phillips, RDA, Gamrot. Um, I mean, Macy Barber is about as exciting as you get for women's MMA. And the list goes on, dude. You get to the main card, and it's just lights out, fight after yeah. fight. So, yeah, I'm pumped. I know you're pumped. Like you said, we're going to be there in attendance uh, with the home of fight crew, and it's going to be crazy, man. I think there's, if I count it correctly, 16 ranked fighters on this card. And that doesn't include Michael Venom Page, who's on the main yeah. card. Uh, Kyler Phillips, who's also a very good fighter on the prelims, and then you know, a couple other good prelims. And then you got the debut in Rubellas to Spain. We'll go over that. Let's just jump right into it. Started with the first fight of the night. You touched on it. Joanne Wood sitting at plus 176 against Marina Moroz at minus 230. The opening bout of the night. There's going to be some Miami traffic. So if you miss this one, it's not the end, end of the world. But uh, either way, we get a women's MMA fight. Joanne Wood, I believe this is going to be her retirement fight. Um, she's been pretty vocal about it. She is 38 years old. I would say it's probably a good time to hang him up. And she's coming in as a dog. And this is a rematch. Marina Moroz made her UFC debut uh, against Joanne Wood. And she picked up a win. Round one armbar. That was 2015. So nine years later, they meet again. And a lot has happened since then, so you could pretty much just wipe that one out. But Marina Moreau is a pretty chalky favorite here. What are you thinking? Yeah, I hate chalky uh, women's mixed martial arts favorites like this. And this one's no different. I mean, if Joanne Wood didn't come out and say that she's retiring and this was her last fight, like I'd be jumping and chomping at the bit to, to take her as this big of an underdog. But, you know, the fact of the matter is she's probably one foot in, one foot out. You hate to see that from any fighter that you're trying to back. Um, because maybe they're not as dialed in, they're not as focused, they're training as hard. But you know, if she has been, I am. Uh, I don't know why Morose would be a minus two hundred favorite here. If I'm being honest, like if she gets the fight to the ground, yeah, she might look that way. But Morose isn't like the most dominant wrestler by any means. She doesn't even average one takedown per fight. She hits him at a twenty two percent clip. Um, she's got good submissions when she gets it there. But when she doesn't, I think she's a tad slower than other girls on the feet. I don't think she hits as hard. Um, is other girls in the division and uh, Joanne Wood on the feet is pretty technical. I mean, she stood and, and traded with Luana Carolina um, for that whole entire fight, three rounds. And Luana Carolina is one of the better strikers right now up and coming. And she outlanded her 131 to 100, land a couple takedowns herself, stuff some um, somewhat trip and, and little takedown um, attempts from Luana there. But she looked good in that fight. And that was her last fight. Before that, she's fighting girls like Tyler Santos and Alexa Grasso. So, She's fighting the top. She's losing to the top. But, uh, you know, I don't think Marina Moroz is anywhere near the top. And I think a, a dog shot on Joanne Wood is not a bad play here. And I'm thinking about it, dude. Something about these women underdogs on pay-per-views always seem to come through. And, uh, you know, I do think Joanne Wood will have the striking advantage in this fight. Yeah, yeah I agree. You I mean, you nailed it on the head. I think if this fight plays out on the feet, it's Joanne Wood all day, especially at plus 176. I think that's kind of growing a little bit, too. Um, she's just going to have more volume. She's a little bit cleaner, uh, just a lot more active. Marina Moroz, she wants to win this fight. She's got to get to the ground. And 
that's really why I think she's minus 230. Like, she could get it to the ground, sub her, and make it look easy because Joanne Wood's been submitted five times. Yeah. She's got 59% takedown defense. It's just like, can Marina Moros do it? Like, she's not a world beater by any means. Last girl she subbed was Maria Agapova, no longer in the UFC. It's not like she's going in there getting subs all the time. Like, she's just, you know, kind of an average fighter. It seems like she's a little overvalued here. I want to take the dog, Joanne Wood. Uh, just a dog or pass type of fight for me. I mean, maybe if the Moreau's sub line is like super juicy, I might sprinkle on that uh, because that is a great path to victory for her. But at these odds, I got to go with the dog yep. because it's women's MMA and Joanne Woods is going to be better on the feet. So she's scrappy too. I mean, yeah. she's not going to, she's not going to be a pushover. And uh, I think a lot of the line is just because, you know, Moreau's did submit her back in the day a long, long time ago. So, yeah, that is a <laughs> and one last thing. Moreau's rematched Kareen Silva, and I think Moreau's yeah. beat her the first time, and then she just lost to her. So right, it's and, like a long time ago. So I mean, there's a lot that could change. We talk about Wood being one foot in, one foot out. I mean, Moreau's doesn't seem completely dedicated either. I mean, people talk about the OnlyFans fade. I mean, she's <laughs> in that in that category. So I mean, if you, if you believe in that kind of stuff, you're kind of taking one fade from another here, but. um Nonetheless, like I, I think it could be a decent women's scrap at the end of the day. Yeah, it is a home game for Moreau's, though. Trains yeah, at true. ATT, so it won't be a long trip for Not like the crowd's going to be on her side by any means, but yeah, I'll take one. Move on. CJ Vergara coming in as a big underdog against Asu Almabayev. Almabayev, 1-0 in the UFC, a good debuting performance. Submitted Ode Osborne in the second round. Big favorite here against CJ Vergara, who is scrappy. The guy comes out to fight, and he's tough, but he doesn't have the most skills out there uh, in the flyweight division. And, uh, you know, I mean, flyweights aren't really like a, a weight class where you like to take the big favorites, but it seems like Alma Baev should get this one done. It's a wide line, though. What do you think? Yeah, no, definitely a wide line for a guy in Alma Baev who's only got one UFC fight. But when you look at CJ, in my opinion, He's not like a bad fighter anywhere. He's got decent takedown defense. He's got good volume. He does get hit a little bit. Um, he is tough as well, as we saw in the Daniel Acerta fight. But you look at all of his wins, man. He's beaten Venetia Salvador, who I don't you know, hold in, in high regards in the least bit. Same with Daniel Acerta. Hasn't won in the UFC. Just been finished six times, five times in a row. Beat Clydeson Rodriguez by split decision in a fight that he got outstruck and taken down twice. And, uh, you know, Clydeson had had some good submission attempts, too. And then besides that, he beat Bruno Correa on the on the contender series. So it's not like he's beating any really good fighters. And the guys that he is, are beating, like Venetia Salvador, who really slowed down that fight, Lacerda, who completely gassed after having Vergara hurt in the first round. Um, you know, he's kind of beating these guys after they're basically just done and have nothing left in the tank. And I don't know if I really see that happening with uh, Alma Baev here. He seems like he's a legit contender or prospect, excuse me. He's got powerful striking. He throws these big overhand rights, uh, kind of sets up his takedowns. And when he gets guys on the ground, he looks like he has really good control. If he takes the back, um, he'll look for submissions. And he's pretty talented on the ground too, which I think, um, you know, if he can get CJ down, I just don't see a scenario where CJ's working back to his feet without giving his back and without getting at least caught in a, a tricky situation at some point in this fight. So if, if I were to take CJ, I'd look late in the fight, just on the off chance that maybe he does um, give Alma Baev a little more than he wants in the first few rounds and Alma Baev gets tired and, and then CJ can find a finish. But at the end of the day, man, I think this is uh, this should be Alma Baev all day long. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, I'll probably look for a Alma Baev <laughs> submission prop or maybe play Alma Baev inside the distance because – it's flyweights. Uh, CJ Vergara has been subbed a couple times. Alma Baev, great at taking the back once he gets into the ground. In all, all reality, he probably does get Vergara to the ground eventually. So I like Alma Baev here. I uh, don't love the price because it's super chalky. Probably won't make a parlay of mine because it doesn't really add too much. Uh, but I'll probably look for a prop, either sub or inside the distance. We move on to the debut of the Cuban Taekwondo bronze medalist. Robelis to Spain, coming in as a big favorite against Josh Parisian. He is 35 years old, to Spain is, but you look at the height, six foot seven, the reach, 87 inches. 
and he's taking on a guy in Josh Parisian who does have UX, UFC experience, but it's not the highest level. <laughs> he's two and four. His wins are against Roque Martinez and Alan Bedell. Losses to Parker Porter, Dante Mays, Jamal Pogues, and Martin Budai. So he's fighting the bottom of the barrel, and he's not even 500. Robel is to Spain, 4 0. Combined record of his opponents are not good. I think it's what one and five or something one like that. Four or five, yeah, it's one not. Yeah, yeah, one and five. I think guys that are pretty much making their debut or yeah. have one fight. So I mean, he's not, but he was knocking him out in, in like less than five seconds in at least two of them. So yeah. he's getting the job done. He's doing exactly what he needs to do. We haven't seen a lot of them. That's kind of where a lot of people are getting kind of cold feet because you haven't really seen too much of him on tape. Um, but he's taking on a guy in Parisian who's just not very good. What do you think? Here's what scares me about Despain, and I, I think he is talented, obviously, with the striking, and I think he should come out here and start Josh Parisian. But I feel like he's kind of caught in this <clears throat> in-between, um, like with the UFC. You know, he's 36 years old, 35, about to be 36. Um, and, you know, it's kind of now or never for him. He's only 4-0. And he's beat guys that are making their debut. But, you know, I feel like on the regional scene, finding good heavyweight opponents with experience is kind of hard to come by. So I don't mind the 4 0 record and beating these bums, but it's kind of tough to justify getting to the UFC on that. But on the other side, it's like, you know, he's 35 years old. It's, it's literally now or never. You can't come into the UFC at 38. I mean, I guess if you're Yoel Romero, who's also from Cuba, maybe, maybe it's just these in these guys' DNA to hit their prime around 40. But um, I, I just think it's kind of a, a tricky situation. I do think he should beat Parisian, but I do think he's going to struggle as he climbs the ranks because, yeah, he's a Taekwondo medalist in the Olympics 12 years ago. And I also would wonder how good the Taekwondo heavyweight division is, is at like the yeah. Olympic level. Like, who knows? I mean, it's heavyweight. So you just never know there. Um, if he has good takedown defense, he should be fine. I wor I don't really worry too much in this fight, but if Parisian can just kind of duck and grab onto him for a full round and put him against the cage, uh, what happens when he gets tired or what happens when he gets put on his back one time? Like it's going to get very interesting. I don't know. I think he might be a little too athletic, obviously, and, and too big, obviously, here for Parisian to have success with the grappling, wrestling, and, and takedowns. But, um, you know, as he progresses, it, it could become a real problem for him. I do think he beats Parisian. That's the pick. Um, I think the UFC is setting him up for a win in Miami right now. Um, but I, dude, I got some questions about him going forward after this one. Yeah, I mean, we saw it last week. Like the heavyweight division is just trash yeah. outside, like the top ten. It's it's bunt. It's complete cheeks. So for him to be getting these wins on the regional scene, like if the UFC heavyweight division outside the top 10 is that bad it's not like he's gonna be able to find anybody on the regional scene that's any good so he should be yep. doing this to those guys and then uh parisian is the definition of bottom of the barrel for the heavyweight division so i would expect i mean i'm, I'm be real honest i don't think there's any other outcome than a Spain round one ko yeah like, i just don't see a way that parisian wins this fight i don't think he could survive even three minutes of like Despain throwing shots at him. I mean, he got hit with 42 significant strikes in the first round from Martin Budai. And that round didn't even go the full five minutes. It only went four minutes. He got submitted in the first round. Parisian's just very slow. You can see it on the screen. He's very tubby. It's not like he's got great wrestling. Doesn't Poor have cardio. Great, doesn't have good cardio. Yeah. Uh, Despain is all, he's just going to come out swinging because he's, He's never fought a guy that has given him anything. So he's going in there with all the confidence, uh, and I think it's just going to be a cakewalk for him. Um, I mean, obviously, your minus 340 is like it's kind of tough for heavyweights, not really knowing too much. Um, but I think he probably just gets him out of there around 1 KO. Uh, so you got to take a look at the, uh, the prop when it comes out. I would expect it to not be very juicy, but I'll probably be playing it because this is I like don't see anything else. I think it's yeah. just round one KO. Like Parisians is terrible. <laughs> this is like one where I would honestly be interested in seeing what the odds are on those like under 60 second KOs. 
Yeah. Like, I, I a lot of times you get them at like plus 300, 400 for like the heavy hitters when they're fighting nobodies. Um, so if he came out here, I mean, I could see him ending this thing like right away. First punch type scenario. Um, yeah. And, and I see a lot of people like being like, yo, Parisian's got a ton of experience in the UFC. Like, have you watched his fights? <laughs> yeah. He's they're slop. disgusting, bro. Like, yeah. Parker Porter beat him. Dante Mays finished him. Jamal Pogues beat him. Martin Budai finished him round one. Like, he's, he's not good. You watch the film on him, and you're like, dude, this guy doesn't have anything to offer, really. Yeah. Like, the only thing is that he's six foot four, and if he gets you down, I guess he can lay on you. But that's his only hope. Yeah. I his just, only hope is to survive the first three minutes. That's his only hope. Yeah. And you're getting a an eighty seven inch wrench, every eighty seven inch reach guy. It's like he's got to get in on the inside too. So he's gonna have yeah. to like find his way on the inside and then find his way out. He just doesn't have the the equipment to do that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's to Spain round one K off all that. We move on. Michelle Pereira coming in at minus one fifty six against Miha Olashechek. Olashechek, slight underdog here. Uh, I guess. Not super slight, but he's a plus one twenty two dog. This guy Ola Shechek, is super fun to watch. I think he's one of the most underrated guys as far as fan viewing experience because he just comes in there to kill you with a big left hand, and he will take some shots. The fight he had with Chidi and Jokawani, he got hit with a nasty head kick, stumbled a little bit, and then was just like, "All right, I'm coming to kill you," and he did it. Michelle Pereira, also very fun to watch. Flies around the cage, jumping everywhere, jumping off the cage, flying knees, anything. And then uh, he moves up to 185, rightful weight class for him, round one KO last time out. Should be a great fight. This is crazy that's on like, the early prelims because this is an amazing fight as far as viewing experience goes. What do you think? Yeah, this is like a, a fight night co main event, like an Apex yeah. card co main event. And, um, you know, Pereira moving up to 185 here is is interesting because I, I think he was killing himself trying to get down like to a lower weight class. You know what yeah. I mean? And he had power down there, but I think he might hold a little bit more up at 185. He's not cutting as much weight. His cardio, his like output has always been fine. Um, you know, he'll eat a pretty good shot too. His striking defense isn't bad at all. And I like that he's got a little bit of grappling in his back pocket, especially in this fight against all Zaychek because we've seen all Zaychek taken down before. He's got under a 50% takedown defense. And there's times when he'll, he'll kind of get a guy in trouble a little bit or hurt and kind of dip under and he's gets put on his back and it's happened. We've seen it happen, you know, against Cody Brundage three times before he reversed position and knocked him out. Kyle Barallo took him down three times. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't mind paying this price on, on Pereira here. I do think the striking will be pretty even. All of Zaychek hits extremely hard, but I, I like the chin of Pereira. Uh, he's on a win streak. He's riding momentum. Um, you know, coming off of a big knockout win against Petrowski, I could see him hurting all of Zaychek too in this fight. I mean, Chidi in the last one had him hurt before he, you know, got finished himself. I think if Pereira finds the chin and finds it often, he's he's going to have success. And all of Zaychek, love his boxing. I love his movement. He kind of hops in and out and lands some really good combinations, but he has the most success when guys are, you know, when he's fighting another technical boxer or a grappler. I don't know how well he's going to deal when a guy's not standing in front of him trading, when a guy like Pereira is moving around, throwing unorthodox strikes and, uh, you know, really keeping him on his toes and keeping him guessing. I think it's going to open the door for Pereira to land some shots in that process. Overall, I just think he, he um, you know, might just have more tools in his arsenal to beat all his check here. He'll mix in the grappling a little bit, kind of slow down me call. And if he can do that, I could see him, you know, kind of grinding out a decision, landing a little bit more volume here and walking away with the W. Uh, should be a very good fight, though. I'm excited for this one. Two phenomenal strikers at 185. I mean, that's like the prime division for striking, dude. You're not the small guy. You're not the biggest guy. Uh, but these guys are put together, they're strong, and it should be a hell of a fight. Yeah, this is one that I've kind of gone back and forth because I see a path where Ola Shechek could get in his face, make him uncomfortable, and break him kind of as the fight goes on. Um, and Pereira, in 40 fights, he's only been knocked out once. I mean, it seems like the chin is pretty good. Uh, and the movement he has, 
should be able to avoid those big left hands. Um, and moving up to 185, you got to think the cheat has got to be a little bit better. Also going to be bigger here. I mean, he's six yeah. foot one. I think he's a little bit, I don't mean, he's a little bit more muscular. I mean, I will shake check used to fight at 205. So, I mean, he's not like a small 185er, uh, but the move to 185 was definitely the right move for him. He's really just been struggling with getting taken down and submitted on the ground. And Pereira is just not really showing like he's willing to take fights to the ground if that's his path to victory. He's kind of a guy that wants to put on a show with the striking. Um, so, I mean, as a favorite, I don't necessarily love it. I think Pereira probably has more tools to get this done just based on uh, striking, being in and out, the movement, uh, having the advantage on the ground, I would assume. Um, and then I think his cardio is decent enough. I think at 170, the cardio was a question because of the the cut, but I think at 185, it would be a little bit better. So for the pick, I'm going to go with, with Pereira, but I don't love it. I don't love it because Ola Shechek's a guy that just takes one. All right, He just clips you with one. You're on the ground. He's got some nasty ground and pound. I mean, he got taken down by Cody Brundage three times. It is Cody Brundage. But he got taken out three times, and then he ended up just reversing and landing ground and pound. Got him out. So he's dangerous. He's very dangerous. Uh, I mean, if there's a dog you like, I mean, Ola Shechek is a very dangerous dog. Uh, but for the pick, I'm going to go with Pereira. I, uh, the one thing that makes me nervous about seeing a finish on the Pereira side is he did not get Andre Fialo out of there. And everybody has gotten Andre out of there besides Pereira, it feels like. Um, that was the only reason I leaned decision in this one um, because I think he's tough enough not to get knocked out. And I think uh, all his A check is too. So um, yeah, possible over. fight of the night, though. Over under is one and a half, minus 175 for the over. Might be a sneaky little play there. Yeah. We move on to Iwan Kudalaba versus Felipe Linz. At the time that the slides were made, there's no line. But the line right now is Iwan Kudalaba minus 135, Felipe Linz plus 105. So a slight dog on the Linz side. He is 38 years of age. And uh, if you don't know Felipe Linz by now, he was the PFL champ at heavyweight, comes in the UFC, um, and then just a bunch of canceled bouts, comes back to the light heavyweight division, and he's 3-0 and since then. So three-fight win streak for him. Kudalaba, always been an undersized 105 or 205 or not 105, 205-er. Um, and he's coming off a win after snapping a three-fight losing streak against Tanner Bozer. Round one KO, we were there for that. And the guy in Kudalaba is a dangerous dude. The thing that's kind of failed him is his size for one, and then for two, later in the fights, the cardio sometimes gives out on him. What are you thinking on this one? Yeah, I don't, I don't even know if like his cardio is bad. I think he's just like not very. Um, he doesn't conserve energy at all. Like he's just like got one speed and it's a hundred mile an hour, and I think it bites him in the ass. Obviously, like in the last, not the Bozer fight, but the three before that. You know, he got finished in the first and second or, or second round in all of those fights. Um, Felipe Lenz, though, being 38 scares me a little bit, especially looking at that he, he's beat Maxim Grishin, uh, OSP, and Marcin, Marcin Pracnio. Those are his last three fights. None of those guys are offering him a little bit of resistance. Like He was kind of just able to stay there, strike with them uh, against Pracnio, landed four takedowns, kind of just did what he wanted. Nobody really got in his face. Nobody applied the pressure. Uh, I mean, Kudalaba is going to do it from the get-go. That's what would scare me, bet, uh, betting on the lens side. And mm -hmm. this guy got knocked out by Tanner Bozer in round one, uh, not that long ago, like during COVID. Um, so, you know, if Kudalaba comes out and lands some big shots, I think he could do it too. I think he could also, um, you know, put him against the cage and try to slow Lens down. He just can't just be looking for these big explosive takedowns over and over. Like he's got to learn to conserve the energy because I do think Lens will probably have the better cardio here. And if it gets out of the first round and a half, I, I think Lens starts looking a little bit better. Um, but I do think that Kudalaba should win the first round. And then if he can just win the next, I don't know if Lens has the uh, finishing upside that I like to, to see him put away Kudalaba here. So I think Kudalaba wins the fight. I think he comes out like a bat out of hell. I could see it in the first round here. Um, but, you know, a lot of that too is just seeing the age gap and what we've seen lately in the UFC. I just don't like betting on these 38 year olds at pick them, near pick them or slight underdogs. They've got to be a little bit more of a dog for me to take a shot on them. 
and have a little bit more finishing upside than Felipe Lins. So I think Kudalaba is more dangerous. Um, I do think he's tough, even though he's gotten finished in the the three fights prior to the Bozer fight. I just don't think Lins is, has any of the finishing ability that Kennedy and Zechiku, Johnny Walker, or Ryan Span have. So give me Kudalaba here. Yeah, the big difference between Felipe Lins and Johnny Walker, Kennedy, and Zechiku, and Ryan Spann is the size. And that's like, like, Iwan Kudalaba is 6'1", 75 inch reach, and he's going up against the 6'6 in Zechiku, a 6'6 Johnny Walker, 6'5 Ryan Spann. Like, what is he going to do against those guys? Yeah. Other than take him down, like, he's kind of screwed. Um, and Felipe Lins only 6'2. He was an ex heavyweight, but I mean, he's, he's a big dude, but he's not as big as Johnny Walker or Kennedy and Zechiku. So I think Iwan Kudalaba is a, a decent side here. I think the level of competition is much different between these two guys. Kudalaba was much better uh, as far as level of competition. Fought Ankle Live twice, Khalil Roundtree, Glover Teixeira, Dustin Jacoby, Ryan Span, Johnny Walker. I could go on. Like Felipe Linz is fighting the OSPs at. 80 years old and Martian Prakmios and Andre Arlovsky lost Andre Arlovsky back in 2020. So, I mean, <laughs> I think Kudalaba's the side here. The only thing that scares me is like, it's Kudalaba. The guy's a madman. So like yeah. he could just go out there, blow his gas tank and then get finished. And you're sitting there like, damn, he should have won that fight, but he didn't. Uh, so I think he wins the fight. I think it could be an early finish. Uh, I would scare me if the fight goes later, but I think Kudalaba, is the side on this one all day. I mean, it's crazy. He knocked out Khalil Roundtree not that long ago, like 2019. And then since then, his only wins are Devin Clark and Tanner Bozer. But if you look at the losses, it is. It's like Glover Teixeira, Magomed Ankalaev, Johnny Walker, like, dude, the top guys, like guys that are just fighting in contender fights. And Glover Teixeira was the ex champion before the whole mess at 205. So, yeah, this is kind of a, a step down for him. And um, if he can just conserve his energy and be a little smarter, I think he's going to have a lot of success. Yeah. I mean, you think Lynn's a guy on a three fight win streak. Kudalaba's one and or two and three in his last five. So it's like, you know, the, it's a little bit of recency bias there. So I think Kudalaba. He's still a slight favorite, too, which is like kind of tells you something. Mm -hmm. I like it. We move on. Pedro Munoz coming in as the dog against Kyler Phillips. Kyler Phillips. With the long hair, just look at his face, man. It's a weird, weird, uh, kind of a feminine looking face. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> uh, but he is nine years younger than Pedro Munoz, and we do know age plays a massive factor in the lower weight classes. This being bantam weight, Pedro Munoz been around for a long time, got a lot of experience. Kyler Phillips uh, had that period of inactivity, and then comes back against Hione Barcelos and gets a win by decision. What are you thinking on this one? Yeah, I see a lot of people on Pedro as the dog this week. Um, but like you mentioned, man, the age, Pedro's getting up there. He's been in some tough fights. You know, um, Cheeto Vera, Cheeto landed 141 significant strikes on him uh, in, in August. Then he beats Chris Gutierrez, who kind of just stands there and fights to the level of his competition. And he's losing to Dominic Cruz, Jose Aldo, Sean O'Malley. Like he's fighting the top guys. But I just think, you know, now he's a little bit older. Instead of fighting the top guys who are also been in the game a while, he's getting a young up and coming guy who's hungry, um, who wants this win. His only loss in the UFC is Holly and Paiva by majority decision. And, um, you know, when you compare stats and what you think is going to happen on the feet here, Pedro is probably going to be kick heavy like he normally is. He's a little shorter. He's going to be at a seven inch reach disadvantage. I think it's going to be harder for him to, you know, connect on some of those shots. And Kyler Phillips fights pretty well from the outside and throws good volume doing it, but his striking defense is really good. Like he's got a 61% striking defense, uh, gets hit with way less than he absorbs. And on the other hand, Pedro Munoz gets hit with a little more than he absorbs. I do think Kyler Phillips is going to have success on the feet. I do think his grappling is good enough to, you know, he should win those exchanges too. And I don't know if he's going to be looking to get Pedro down the whole fight or anything. Um, Pedro's got good takedown defense. But again, it comes back to the age and the strength. I think all of that, obviously, on Kyler Phillips' side here. I just don't know, unless Pedro just clips Kyler somewhere in an exchange, I just don't know where he's going to really take over this fight um, in the first two rounds. Uh, I think three-round fight, 
Kyler does kind of slow down, but I just don't see any world where, unless there's a finish where he doesn't beat Pedro in the first two here on volume, on grappling, on, um, you know, just hitting Pedro more than he hits Kyler. So I, I don't, I'm not necessarily, you know, too inclined to take a dog shot here on Pedro, maybe four years ago, but, you know, at his age now, I'm just not jumping at it. Yeah, I think there's a path to victory for Pedro, and it kind of suits his game plan pretty well based on the leg kicks would slow down Kyler Phillips' movement. Phillips is a guy that likes to move around the cage, uh, kind of be in and out. Like you said, his striking defense super high based on his movement. It's super good. Uh, so if Munoz can land some devastating leg kicks early, slow down the movement, get inside the pocket, he's going to have a seven-inch reach disadvantage, so he's going to have to overcome that. And then he's got rock-solid takedown defense. So if, if Phillips tries to get the fight to the ground, uh, Munoz, 82% takedown defense. I think he's only been taken down one time in the last six years. So it's super solid. Like He's not getting taken to the ground by almost anybody. Uh, and I, I think Pedro is a live dog here, but the only thing that scares me is, you know, if Phillips starts getting on him early, uh, chipping away at shots, I think he's going to have more volume just based on the reach, based on the movement. And uh, if he can avoid getting hit with one big one, because that's kind of how Munoz won the fight against Gutierrez. Like he was able to land the bigger shots in the exchanges, still got outstruck by 17 significant strikes, but landed a knockdown. And uh, anytime Gutierrez was in the pocket, he made him pay for it. So if Phillips can avoid that. I think he cruises to a decision win here. But at minus 235, I don't like it. It kind of takes me back to the Bashra fight last week. It's like you're a. Ashrat's a guy that likes to use the movement, likes to be in and out, likes to throw high volume, can mix in the wrestling. But if this fight's going to go to a decision, do I want to take the chalk? I don't. I just don't. Because if Munoz can make it a dog fight, that chalk looks terrible. You know, I mean, I mean this isn't minus 800 like Bashrat, but I think it's a, a similar type of fight where Munoz should be winging bombs, just trying to connect, uh, and maybe he can get the judges to go his way. Uh, so I don't really like the, the chalk on Phillips, but I do think he should win. He'll be the pick for me. We move on to Mateusz Gamrat sitting at minus 430 against the legend RDA, Rafael Dos Anjos, sitting at plus 300, almost 40 years of age for RDA, still doing the damn thing. Going down to 155, uh, he's bounced between 170 and 155. Gamrat has been a guy. I'm sure he's a great guy. Okay, I'm sure he's just one of the loveliest <laughs> people in the world. But this is a fighter that I just hate on. I hate on it day in and day out because I hate his fight style. And I don't think I've ever placed a bet that hit on him. <laughs> like That one thing will make you uh, either a fan of a fighter or a, a big hater on a fighter. Mateusz Gamrot has screwed me over many times. I bet on Fazif last time. He gets the win by... Uh, Injury. I bet on Jalen Turner. I thought Jalen Turner won the fight just based on damage because Gamrot was not landing anything, shooting takedowns, and got knocked down. Bet on McTavish Gamrot against Daryush, and he looked terrible. And then I bet on Sarukian against him, and uh, just a, a split decision. Well, I mean, it was a unanimous decision, but it was a, a fight that I thought Sarukian won. So I'm 0 4 at McTavish Gamrot fights. I don't think I'm touching the chalk here against RDA. Uh, but it is a fight that he should probably win. He's going to be grappling. That's that's his thing. He has decent volume on the feet. Um, and RDA has 56% takedown defense. So you see the line the way it is based on the age, based on the grappling pedigree of Gamrot and uh, somewhat of a, a weakness as far as takedown defense goes for, for RDA. So that's why the line's that way. But it's a chalky, chalky fight. What are you thinking? Yeah, I think I think just based off RDA's last fight with Luke alone, that's where you know a lot of this line's coming from. I mean, Luke was able to take him down eight times, had a ton of success, looked a lot stronger, and then you put Gamrod in there, whose only game plan is to take you down over and over, and who's more of a pure wrestler than a guy like Luke. I mean, I think he should have a lot of success with the takedowns here. Um, it is down at one fifty five, so you know maybe RDA might be slightly. You know, he's not going up against the guy who's going to be a lot bigger than him by any means. Um, I think RDA's technical striking is obviously better here. I just don't know if he's got that pop anymore in his hands, being that he's nearly 40 years old. Um, 
so yeah, I, I just think this is Gamrod all day unless he gets clipped. I just don't, I just can't really see it though. Don't think it's going to be a, a real fun fight by any means. I mean, already er, uh, Gamrod has a clear path to victory and it's what he does every single fight. RDA, 56% takedown defense. Now you're going up against one of the best wrestlers in the division right now. I just think this is going to be Gamrot putting RDA on his back, not obviously not submitting him or landing much ground and pound and RDA just kind of, you know, fighting to get back to his feet and rinse and repeat. I think it's going to be boring. I think Gamrot's going to win. I wish I'd take RDA. I just, at this point, man, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's just a stay away fight for me. And yeah. the over has got to be probably like what? Chalk. Minus 300 minus 400. <laughs> Super shocked. And it goes back to the same fight that we just broke down. Like it's uh Gamrot. It's going to shoot a lot of takedowns. going to be a lot of chain wrestling, not going to land a ton of damage. And uh, it's a fight that's minus 300 for the over two and a half. So a fight that's probably going to go to decision. Do I want to put my minus 430 ticket in the hands of the judges? Not really. So it's probably one I'll lay off. I think Gamrot probably wins, uh, but RDA He's still good, man. He's still very technical. Just beat Moicano a couple of years ago by complete domination. So he's still alive. Uh, but yeah, I think Gamera probably wins. Just don't like leaving it in the hands of the judges. So I'll take Gamera for the pick, but probably won't I'll lay off. We move on to Caitlin. I think it's Sarah Minara, but you'll mostly know her by Caitlin Shikagian. Coming in as the dog against Macy Barber, who's sitting at minus 205. See the age difference there. 10 years younger is Macy Barber. And she's getting the Caitlin Shikagian treatment here for a long time. Caitlin Shikagian was the path to the belt. You beat Caitlin Shikagian, you get a title shot. Long time, number one contender. She lost to Manon Fioro, her last fight, which was quite a long time ago. Um, back at UFC 280 which was about a year and a half ago. Uh, Macy Barber coming off a career best performance. where She got a TKO in the second round against Amanda Kiba. She is on a five fight winning streak. Do you think that's played into the line here? Yeah. Yeah, I, I really, I do. But, you know, Bas Macy Barber has been uh, tough to get a, a really accurate read on because she gets like in these fights, like with Miranda Maverick, for example, split decision, um, Miranda even outstruck her in that fight. Both had a takedown and she loses. And then she gets to Andrea Lee after a couple wins and another split decision, which a lot of people thought she lost. And that's Andrea Lee. What we saw just happened to her against Miranda Maverick. But then she comes out against Amanda Hebos, who's way better than Lee, in my opinion, and just absolutely smokes her. So it, it's just been kind of like this roller coaster. But at the same time, like when the when the fights go to decision, the judges do not want Macy to lose. It's crazy. Yeah. Like they have so much, it seems like they have so much bias towards her. And I do feel like this fight here with Caitlin is heading towards a decision. Both girls are good striker. Macy's more of a brawler, I would say. And Caitlin obviously has very, very technical striking. I mean, she did lose the Manon Faro, but before that, she's beaten uh, Amanda Hebos by decision, Jennifer Maya decision, Vivian Araujo, a decision, Cynthia Calvillo decision. So she's not a finisher. Um, her technical striking and those front kicks kind of keep distance very well. And she racks up a lot of volume and uh, wins on points a lot of times, which I could see being a little downfall for Macy here. But this is another fight. It's like the theme of this card where you got a young, hungry up and comer against a vet who, you know, is getting up there in the mid 30s now. Doesn't matter as much in women's mixed martial arts, but, um, you know, I think Macy should win this fight. She's minus 205. I'm definitely not interested in that line on her just because I've seen some fights that she makes way closer than they should be. And, you know, Caitlin Simonara is, you know, the perfect example of a fighter who's able to go and get in those dicey split decisions with her striking and using those front kicks to keep Macy off of her, landing good volume in between. I think this one's going to be a lot closer than, uh, than the line shows here. Yeah, I... I Again, it's the over two and a half in this fight is minus 350. So it's going to go to decision in all reality. Macy Barber is not a potent finisher. Uh, and her last finish was against Amanda Hibas, who is the type to get into a dog fight, like kind of just start throwing. And yeah. she's been knocked out a couple of times. Caitlin Chikagian is not that type of fighter. She's not going to get into a firefight exchange with, uh, in the pocket and hope that she lands something big. Like she's going to stand at range, use her kicks, use her jab, 
uh, user one, two, and try to outpoint you to a decision. Uh, and honestly, I think this line is is a little, I mean, it's super recency bias. Like hey, Barber's five, five win streak, Chikagan coming off a loss. Uh, I understand the age. Uh, this is a women's MMA fight that I think the only way I'd play it is the dog because I don't think Macy Barber is is really anything great on the feet. I don't understand she's probably improving. She's 25, um, but I mean, a few years ago, she lost to Roxanne Mataferi, and she got knocked down in that fight. She got outstruck in that fight, and she got outgrappled in that fight. So it's like, Chikagin's still got very good skills, um, and honestly, I think in women's MMA, the age gap doesn't mean that much. Yeah. Like, not as much as, as men's MMA. I don't think it means that it's not equivalent as far as, as everything goes. Because a lot of these women's fighters don't really rely on, like, their explosiveness or their athleticism, even durability. Like, it's just a different way. So, I think uh, the only way I'd play this is Kayla Chikagin. I guess I'll take her for the pick as well. Um, and, yeah, I guess we can move on. Another one, one more thing on this one is I think there's going to be a big size disadvantage for Macy too. Like Caitlin's five, nine, five, nine and a half and Macy's five foot five. Yep. Caitlin will have a few inches of reach, but I just feel like Caitlin's pretty put together too. Like she's pretty, she's pretty buff. And, uh, I think she will look like quite a bit bigger than Macy on fight night and those kicks up the middle to keep Macy away. I just think it's going to be a harder fight than Macy for Macy than people think. Yeah. Chikagi missed weight her last time out weighed in at one twenty seven and a half. She misses weight in this one. I'm I'm all over it because we all know if you miss weight, you're probably going to win the fight because that just seems how it goes. But yeah, we can move on to the prelim, the feature prelim bout. Curtis Blades coming in as a slight favorite over Jelton Almeida. The rebooking. This was supposed to happen in November. Blades pulls out due to injury. In steps Derek Lewis. Jelton Almeida grapples him up for 25 minutes, 21 minutes of control time. And uh, a lot of people weren't happy with that fight because it was supposed to be a quick finisher. You know, everyone wants to see Derek Lewis stand and bang, but Jelton Almeida kind of dominated him for five rounds. And now he gets uh, the rebook in here against Curtis Blades. Curtis Blades, known as one of the better wrestlers in the UFC offensively, he's a guy that can take you down, can land some nasty ground and pound. Uh, but a defensively, 33% takedown defense. Nobody's really looking to take Curtis Blades to the ground. In the past, his big Achilles heel has been against big power punchers. Like His only losses are Sergei Pavlovich, Derek Lewis, Francis Ngannou, like guys that have big power. Jilton Almeida doesn't have big power, but he has uh, some of the best grappling that you will see at the heavyweight division. So it's a, a fun fight. I mean... It could end up being a boring fight, but it's a fun matchup to see what happens. What do you think? Yeah, it's um, you know, it's crazy. The line is completely flipped. When they were first scheduled, I'm pretty sure Almeida was like a minus 180, minus 175 favorite over Blades here. Now Blades a slight favorite. I do think that Blades, you know, always gets the hype of being a wrestler and being a really, really good wrestler at that. But really, I mean, outside of the Volkov fight and the Jarzinho Rosenstruck fight, lately he hasn't really gone to it. Like he got the um, the KO punch over Junior Dos Santos, and then he took down Volkov in the next fight like 14 times, I think, if I'm reading that right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that, you know, he's kind of standing and banging with guys. I thought he would try to implement the the grappling and wrestling right away against Pavlovich, but he just didn't. Um, I think he was maybe well, scared smart. to rush in and get clipped. What? Would have been really smart if he did. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, he wasn't very smart that night. It's, his, it's his only path to victory in that fight. Yeah. Um, and he didn't. I, maybe he was waiting and just got caught before he could get around to it, but it should have been the first thing he did in that fight. Here, I think he'll have the advantage on the feet for um, the first round. I do think, though, Almeida is just going to put him against the cage and look to wrestle, and I think it could slow Blades down a little bit here. I think if Almeida gets Blades down, I mean, people talk about how good Blades is as a wrestler, but, I mean, wrestlers aren't always good off their back, sitting flat on their back with a guy with that good a uh, jujitsu on top of you like that. Like, I would rather have, um, a, like, once the fight hits the ground, I'd rather have a, a good jujitsu practitioner than a wrestler on top any day. So if Almeida gets it down, he could definitely sub Curtis Blades here. 
land some good ground and pound. And I think if that happens early in the fight, I think Blade slows down. I really do. He's going to be much heavier than Almeida here. Almeida, you know, showed against Derek Lewis. He can hold a guy down for, you know, five rounds. Derek Lewis is a guy that has made a name fighting grapplers and just being able to stand back up with ease every single time. And uh, he wasn't really able to do that very often against Almeida. I do think Almeida, though, um, there's a chance that Blades come, can come out and catch him. But, uh, you know, I just I just do see Gileton eventually working this fight down to the ground. And from there, um, you know, doing kind of what he pleases because Curtis Blade, again, off his back. I don't know how good he's going to be. I really don't. And the takedown defense, you can be a great offensive wrestler like he is all you want, but uh, you know, there's a different style in MMA with the wrestling and defending takedowns. So uh, it'll be interesting, but I got to ride with Giles and Almeida. I mean, you're not going to get him at this price very often. Yeah, I, I think this is a great opportunity to snatch up Giles and Almeida at slight like dog money. I mean, I think Curtis Blades won't be able to do anything. I just don't see how he's – I mean, I guess you could maybe look for a takedown on Almeida, but that would be kind of just playing into the, his own game because I think eventually you just reverse him. Like, Almeida's jiu-jitsu is just off the charts. Like, no heavyweight out there. I mean, maybe you could say Tom Aspinall, but, like, it's not like he goes out there and does what Almeida does. Like, his jiu-jitsu is the top level of the heavyweight division. Um, and I think Almeida's explosiveness, like, no, have they don't see that at heavyweight. Like he's not a big heavyweight. He's two thirty six, but he's strong as hell, and yeah. he's fast as hell, and explosive as hell. Like you watch his takedowns, there's like nothing these guys can do. Like he's just in on you before you even know it, and then you're on the ground, and then you're trying to fight back up to the feet, and he's got your back, or he's getting uh, into mount, or he's getting into half guard. He's got fifty five percent takedown accuracy. Mm -hmm. Like he's getting guys down whenever he wants to. And it's not like he plays around on the feet. He just stays at range, stays at range, waits for you to, to come in, and then shoots. It's like you don't even have a chance to really get going with your striking. He's just on you from the jump. Uh, and Curtis Blades, the last time that he knocked somebody out cold with his hands, or really the only time he's knocked somebody out cold with his hands, was Chris Dawkins. Chris Dawkins ain't got no chin. <laughs> so it's like, I guess you could think Curtis Blades is going to catch him with something, but doesn't really do that. And Almeida is going to be just going to be so fast. I just don't think it's a, a fight that Curtis Blades has a great chance in. And maybe he goes out there, is able to stuff takedowns, land some ground and pound of his own or something like that. But I think this is Almeida all day. Uh, I mean, Curtis Blades, guy that's been around for a long time. People know him. Uh, Almeida is kind of his up and comer. It's not a big age difference, but we've seen Curtis Blades. We know what he's he's capable of, and I just don't think the capabilities are there to, to get a win over Almeida. So I'm going to take Almeida. We move on. First fight of the main card, Piotr Jan coming in at minus 120 against Song Yadon sitting at minus 106. This fight has me bricked up. Okay, I <laughs> love this fight. Piotr Jan is always fun to watch. Song Yidong is always fun to watch. And both of them going at it. I just hope nobody shoots a takedown. I just want to see him stand and trade because two of the best boxers in the bantamweight division. Jan is just, he's a killer, man. I mean, he's a guy that has his entire career, he's really only lost one fight definitively. And that was his last one against Marat. Other than that, split decisions and DQ losses. So, I mean, he's, he's in every single fight. Song Yudong, a beast. 26 years of age, amazing boxing, amazing takedown defense. Only losses are to Corey Sanhagen and Kyler Phillips in the UFC. I am insanely excited to watch this fight. What are you thinking as far yeah. as who wins? Yeah, dude, this is definitely one of the best fights on the card. Um, Man, I love... Peter Yawn. And I've always loved him throughout his career. I mean, finishing Jose Aldo, that's crazy. Um, you know, he's beaten guys, beaten legends like Uriah Favor. But even though some of the losses are split decisions lately, like Sean O'Malley, there's a case he won that fight. Um, you know, took Sean down six times. Sean did land more volume, but you know, that was a very close fight. Aljamain Sterling, split decision loss to him. 
Marab, 11 takedowns in the fight, and, and Jan still has an 85% takedown defense, which <laughs> makes me think that, you know, if it's that good against everybody else but Marab, I don't think Song is going to have a bunch of success here um, getting takedowns. So I think it plays out on the feet as well. I think it's a very technical Pyotr Jan versus Yudong, who is technical, but just maybe a tad more aggressive and wild. I don't like that Pyotr Jan is a little bit older now. He's got some wear on his body. Like he's only 31, but just turned 31. But I mean, this guy's had a long UFC career fighting a lot of the top guys. And yeah. Song Yudong, you know, kind of that next wave of fighters that are going to be around the bantamweight top for a while. Oh, I've wanted to hammer Song Yudong at plus money while it's been there. Um, now it's like right near a pick 'em. But something's telling me, you know, this is going to be kind of vintage Jan. This is kind of, um, you know, a style where I think he can have success. Yon, uh, Song is not unhittable by any means. Like we saw against Corey Sandhagen, he just completely lit him up. Uh, got the stoppage from the cut in round four. But, uh, you know, I think it's a very, very even fight. I think the line is probably, you know, maybe right where it should be. I'd look at some kind of decision prop here. Both guys do hit hard, but both guys are also extremely, extremely tough and durable. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's very hard to pick in this fight. I'm going to go with Piotr Jan to kind of have a resurgence here. I mean, he's on a three fight losing streak and he's slight favorite over Song Yudong. I mean, that shows that a lot of people still respect him as a fighter, um, against a killer like this. So I'm going to go, I've kind of flipped. I'm going to go with Piotr Jan, uh, as far as betting goes, I'm going to be looking at, you know, the over, if it's not too chalked, which I'm sure it probably, you know, it could be in this one. Um, but I'll, I'll be interested to see what the, uh, what the, the, fight goes a decision prop is as well yeah this is one i'm not super confident in either side like i i like the value on Jan because he's always usually a pretty big favorite and now he's on the losing streak and he comes in at, at basically a pick him here against a guy in song Yudong whose best wins are chris gutierrez ricky simone I guess Cheeto Vera, but that was kind of a, a robbery yeah. back in 2020. So, I mean, it's not like he's going out there beating guys that are, you know, top five, top, even top 10. Like, Ricky Simone's kind of top 10 to top 15. Um, and he's had a clear striking advantage in that one. Piotr Jan, the thing that scares me about him is at times he's just kind of low volume. Like, he carries that high guard, um, and then it kind of allows – guys to out volume him at times like in his last what five fights he's been outstruck which is scary for a for a fight that is again gonna probably go to a decision i think it's over two and a half i can check it real quick i think it's chalked to like minus minus 280 two, 280 yeah over two and a half is minus 280 so they're expecting it to go to a decision I think that's why Jan's losing these split decisions. It's like he's he lands very clean shots, but he's also allowing his opponent to get off a lot of volume. Um, and if it's a three-round fight, we know Jan to be somewhat of a slow starter. He likes to get his reads as the fight goes on, kind of take over there. So it scares me on the Jan side as far as that goes uh, because you know Song is a very clean striker himself, and I would expect him to come out pretty hot. Uh, lands a lot in combinations. And if Jan's just going to shell up in that guard, you know, those combinations are going to look pretty clean. As, as clean as he throws them, it's going to look good to the judges. Um, so I love the value on Jan. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't know if it's enough to get me to like take his side. I'll take him for the pick. Um, but I don't know if I'll have a bet on this one. I'm already super invested just as a fight fan. Um, and maybe it's just one I want to sit out and just enjoy but i'll take you on for the pick we move on to gilbert burns coming in as the dog against jack della madalena sitting at minus 158 another one of these fights where you get the up-and-coming guy against the vet the uh the guy that's been there he's been in the title fight he's been around for a while everybody knows him the man gilbert burns and i gotta say before we break it down i'm gonna be biased in this one Gilbert Burns is my business partner, okay? So I'm 100% biased here. So Gilbert Burns, I 100% I want him to win. I think he's got a great path to victory in this one. If he can take Jack Della to the ground, we've seen Jack Della get taken down multiple times against guys like Basil Hafez, 
has been uh, in some very tough spots against Basil Hafez, against Sanj Losa, even against uh, Ramazan Amiv. There was a submission attempt he had. Uh, Amiv had a submission attempt on Jack Della. So, I mean, if Gilbert Burns gets those positions, could be wraps because we know Gilbert's got some nasty, nasty jujitsu on the feet. Uh, he's very solid striker as well. Big power. Jack Della, I would assume, would have somewhat of an advantage in the boxing department because you watch him box. You're like, damn, this guy, this guy can box. Southpaw, uh, great lead hand, great jab, and uh, really nice rips to the body, goes up top. Like, it's super clean. It's a fun fight. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I kind of feel the same. Um, everybody's really high on Jack in his boxing and, and uh, understandably so. He's shown really, really good striking in all of his UFC fights. Uh, but man, he puts himself in like bad situations. You touched on it with the Hafez fight and even Angelosa. I mean, Angelosa had a that triangle, arm triangle locked in. Uh, same with Basil Hafez. But man, if Gilbert's the one doing that, I can't imagine a world where Gilbert's not a way closer to finishing that than those other two. Like Gilbert's a mile ahead of those two guys in the jiu-jitsu department. If Gilbert gets on top of him on the ground, which I think he can, I think it could be a bad night for JDM because JDM, very good striker, makes mistakes. When guys try to wrestle him, you know, he'll he'll jump on the guillotine and, and give up basically a position on the ground trying to find a finish that way. He's done it multiple times. He did it multiple times in the uh, Hafez fight and, you know, it kind of bit him in the ass and made that fight a split decision. On the feet, Still, I mean, he fought Kevin Holland in his last fight, and Holland kind of fought to the level of JDM. He just kind of waited for him and then would throw some volume. Didn't really look like he was trying at all. And Gilbert's a guy who's going to get in your face. He's going to throw big shots, and he does have power. Um, and, you know, he lands that big shot on people. He knocked down Hamzat. He drug him all the way uh, to deep waters and went to a decision that was very close with a guy like that. You know, different style, but at the end of the day, I do think on the feet, Jack's going to have some success. Uh, but you know, if Gilbert can get the fight to the ground, he's going to look um, a lot better than these other guys have when they're on top of, top of JDM. Now, Gilbert in his last fight, you know, obviously there was some some injury there early in the fight, and he wasn't able to perform to his, the highest ability. I think that's kind of caked into the line here a little bit. Yeah, I think his age might be a little bit as well. Um, but I mean, you're getting a guy as dangerous as Gilbert at plus one twenty five. It's never a bad play, in my opinion. I mean, the guy has put people out cold. The guy. It gets your neck. It's it's a wrap, um, and he trains with absolute killers too. He's going to be one thousand percent ready for this fight. I don't think it's a bad dog shot at all. Uh, like I said, we'll be in attendance, screaming our heads off for Gilbert in this fight. Uh, there's nobody I'm rooting for more on this card, so I'll take him as the pick here. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm biased. I'm going to take Gilbert for the pick as well. I think the path of victory is there, uh, and the dog is there. I don't think yeah. Jack Ellis seen the dog that like Gilbert Burns has. Like he has, he's fought, fighting these guys that he should win against, and just quite honestly, just don't have the level of grit, right? Like a Gilbert Burns has, and Gilbert Burns has seen everything. Jack Della hasn't seen a Gilbert Burns before, so I'll take Gilbert for the pick. We move on to Kevin Holland sitting as a slight favorite over Michael Venom Page. Michael Venom, Michael Venom Page making his UFC debut out of Bellator, seventeen and two in Bellator. I mean, if you don't know who he is and you watch the fight this Saturday, you'll know who he is after because you watch this guy fight, super entertaining, just a lot of very unorthodox stuff happening. He's going to put on a show, likes to showboat, and I think they gave him a perfect opponent here in Kevin Holland because Kevin Holland's a guy that loves to put on a show, loves to uh, be a little flashy with the striking, and not a guy that's really going to be looking for a lot of takedowns. Uh, in all honesty, that's probably his best path to victory or easiest path to victory is to take Michael Venom Page to the ground. If you watch tape on uh, MVP, fights that he loses, he gets taken down and he just can't get up off his back. So in this one, I need to see if Kevin Holland's going to make like some gentleman's agreement to not take the fight to the ground because he already did that with Stephen Wonderboy Thompson and he lost that fight. So I need to see... I mean, the media day happens tomorrow. This is recorded on a Tuesday. I would assume they're going to ask him that at media day. What's going to happen with that? If he says uh, there's a gentleman's agreement, then uh, Michael Venom Page definitely live as a dog. What do you think? 
Yeah, I, it's tough because Kevin Holland's so unpredictable. You never know what he's going to do. Like he had a clear path to victory against Wonder Boy and just did not stick with it. He would get you know a takedown and then stand back up. Um, so it, it just it makes you wonder how much his head is really in it and how much he's really wanting to get these wins. I think the you know for Kevin Holland the whole title aspirations is kind of out the window at this point in his career. I think um, you know for MVP he's got a lot more stake in this fight it's his ufc debut people have always said you know what's he going to look like if he fights in the best organization and not you know bellator and you're getting a guy who kind of will fight to whatever style you're wanting to bring in kevin holland uh, kevin holland too we saw had a lot of uh, moments in the wonder boy fight where he was just getting eaten alive by those kicks uh in that karate style and that's what that's what mvp is going to bring but the difference with wonder boy and mvp i think um, MVP is a little flashier. He's hits a little bit harder and, you know, he has really good counters too. When guys kind of lunge in, he's very good at pulling, um, and hitting guys. And I don't know, man, something's telling me MVP is going to put on a show here. I don't know if he can knock Holland out because Holland is tough, but I do think he will land the more significant shots in this one. And, uh, I do think the UFC benefits from him winning this fight too. I think the crowd's going to be on his side a little bit. Um, it should be interesting. I'm going to take him for the pick. I just, I just think overall he's going to have more success on the feet. I don't think Kevin Holland's looking to wrestle here. I think he wants to put on shows rather than get wins. Uh, so give me MVP. Yeah, I love Kevin Holland just uh, as a fighter. Like He's super entertaining, uh, but at times I just question like what his motivations are because in a lot of these fights, it seems like he's not really focused on getting a win or at least in times like he, he'll... He won't go for the win. You know what I'm saying? Like it against Jack Della Maddalena, I thought he could have easily at, at some point like pulled away, but he was just kind of pitter pattering. Um, and then after the fight, he loses and he outvolumed him, but it didn't really look like he went for anything. Almost like he was like kind of afraid to get knocked out. And a lot of these fights where he's favored, uh, he can find the finish because he, he thinks he can win the fight. And, uh, not going to get finished. He's very durable. I also question after the Hamza fight, he like said he was going to retire and then comes back against Wonder Boy and then gives the gentleman's agreement. So that just kind of shows you like he doesn't really care if he wins the fight or not. Kind of looking for a paycheck um, and not not that he like needs the money, but just looking for a paycheck, stay relevant and get into the octagon MVP. I love his fight style, and I think it's going to be tough for Kevin Holland because I think he's used to guys that are going to stand there, are willing to to get hit, um, and against wrestlers or grapplers, he has some some great BJJ that he can use to counter that. MVP is a guy that's super hard to hit on the feet. He's going to be in and out. I think it's going to force a lot of problems for Kevin Holland. If he doesn't take the fight to the ground, I would take MVP all day. Um, and I, I'm going to take him for the pick more than anything. I think this fight probably goes to a decision because MVP only been finished once. Kevin Holland only been knocked out once and it wasn't even a knockout. It was just a doctor stoppage. So I think, uh, the fight probably goes the distance and I think MVP does the better work. So I'll take him for the pick brings us to the co-main event. Dustin, the diamond Poirier coming in as a plus 172 dog against Benoit Saint Denis sitting at minus 225. See the age difference there. Poirier coming off the loss, knockout loss to Justin Gaethje. That's probably caked into the line here. Uh, Benoit, seven years younger, looks like an absolute beast at 155. Never lost at 155. Only loss was at 170. In his debut against Alizo Zaleski dos Santos, where he lost by decision, got whooped. Probably a fight that could have been stopped, um, but nonetheless took a loss there. He's a scary dude, man. <laughs> See the face. Like, you could tell this dude's probably killed some people because he's oh, yeah. the, what, special forces? Yep. Our ex special forces. Like, this dude's definitely killed some people and he fights like it because he goes in there, kill or be killed type of type of guy and if he comes in there looking to kill dustin poirier he better kill him so if you don't kill him you're gonna get killed what do you think yeah i think it all just depends on how good dustin poirier's chin is because um he, he's a 
you know, he's got enough experience and he's, you know, a vet in the sport fighting the top guys, the Habibs, McGregor's, Gaethje's. Um, so he's seen every single style. He's been hit with every kind of shot you could possibly get hit with. If he can survive it in the first round, I, I think the the tide starts to dramatically shift to his favor because BSD burns so hot in the first round. And not that he, you know, he does get a little tired. It's not that he's completely gassed and he, he breaks and stops fighting because he'll fight through it. But, you know, if you don't have the cardio and you're fighting a little sloppy against a guy who's as technical as Dustin, who does have good cardio, um, you're just not going to win that fight. If your knockout power is gone, you can't get the takedown against Dustin and you're forced to stand and box with him while you're tired, he's going to make you pay. He's going to rip the body. He's going to look like a, a big favorite if the fight gets into round three and four. And being a five round fight here, I think that's more uh, to Dustin's advantage here. It's all going to come down to the first round, though, because I thought Frivolo would be tough enough to survive that against BSD, and he couldn't. Um, I thought you know he'd be fast enough to avoid some of those big shots too. But BSD's just a he's a hunter, man. He tracks you down like he'll he'll follow you around the octagon and land the big shots. He mixes in the wrestling really well. He's very strong. So you know if Dustin can't survive. You know, it, no skin off his back, really. BSD is the truth, in my opinion. But, um, you know, there comes a point in a lot of these guys' career like BSD where, you know, the experience does kind of catch up to them when they're fighting a guy like Dustin. Uh, I don't know if it's this situation exactly right here. He's looked very, very good. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's against um, Stoltz, Gabriel Miranda, Ismail Bonfim. Tiago Moises and Matt Favola. Like this is a big jump up in competition and experience in my opinion. So yeah, if Dustin can stay away and not get hit, I think this could be like the live betting spot of the year because I do think he probably will lose the first round. I do think he's probably going to be in, in defense mode early in this fight because like I said, he's been in so many five round fights. He knows how to navigate those early rounds. He knows how to survive um, you know, I guess he has been knocked out, but you know, he's, he's going to have a game plan set in place to get himself past the halfway point in this fight to where he can take over. And that's what would scare me about putting BSD and all your parlays and, you know, paying minus two twenty five on him. Um, also Dustin's never lost two fights in a row. It doesn't really mean a lot to me. I see a lot of people talking about that. I don't really buy into a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I do think plus plus one seventy five on Dustin. I think if you just wait, just wait till after round one. I think you'll have a better price. Yeah, I don't really buy into the never lost two fights. Yeah, no, really. it's <laughs> like, all right, you you lose to like Islam, you rematch <laughs> Islam, like yeah. you're gonna lose two in a row. So or Habib, like, like it, yeah, yeah, like it, I don't think it really means anything. It's not like they're coming off a loss and they're like, there's no way I'm losing this fight. Right. It just comes out of like matchups. Um, but I have some some biases to the Dustin Poirier side, so I'm gonna try to put those aside and give you the best breakdown I can. I think BSD needs to grapple and grapple early because he needs to get on top of him, make him feel his strength. Um, and he, he's a guy that kind of does it. I mean, he comes out pretty hot with the takedowns. He kind of throws a bunch of bombs at you, then goes for the takedown. He wants to just wear you out and uh, eventually break you. I think that's his biggest strength is he's just a guy that is going to go in there and his opponent's going to break before he does. On the Poirier side, he's just going to be a lot cleaner. Like BSD throws so wild at times, and it's not like he's knocking dudes out with like his fists where he lands like some really precise shot. Yeah. Like he's just going to throw hard, and he's going to hope it lands. And on the Poirier side, he's shown many times if you you swing wild, he's going to be able to counter you with some good shots. This fight goes longer. It is five rounds. I think that favors Poirier. The question is, can he make it there? Obviously, coming off the knockout loss, uh, there's a lot of you know, a lot of doubters that are like, all right, he might be finished. 35 years of age isn't terrible. Like it's not 38. It's not 40. Now Poirier's been in a lot of wars. So that does raise a lot of concerns. But this price, man. Yeah. Poirier plus 172. Against BSD, whose best win is Matt Frivola. You know, like Frivola was unranked until he knocked out Drew Dober. And uh, I'm kind of getting some Fazeev Gaethje vibes. Like Fazeev was a minus 200 some favorite. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
couldn't get him out of there early. And Gaethje was coming off the loss to Charles, I believe, where he got knocked down a couple of times. Um, and just able to weather the storm, wins the second, wins the third. So I think this is a fight that's very winnable for Dustin Poirier. At plus 172, uh, I'm going to take it for the pick. Like I said, I am a little bit biased. I got some connections to the Poirier side. Um, but, I mean, this is still great value. You're getting a dog shot on a guy, Dustin Poirier, who's fought for the title multiple times. A lot of experience. He's fought guys like Hubby, like Charles Oliver, like the cream of the crop. BSD is a beast. Um, but at this price, I just don't even think I'd play it. I really don't. That's what, I mean, it, like you said, you think BSD has to come out and grapple. If you're on the Poirier side, I think you hope he does. Because we saw against like Zaleski Dos Santos, he came out grappling right away and he got tired, man. He got really, really tired. This is a big stage, a big moment, biggest card of the year um, against one of the names who's been around in the division forever at the top. And honestly, I, I don't know if he can submit Dustin Poirier. BSD has good grappling. He's strong and he gets himself in good situations using that, but he's not like a jujitsu wizard by any means. Um, you know, I think Dustin can survive. Uh, and if he does, man, I, it, Dustin's just got to get to the second round. Like that's name of the game. First and foremost, get to the second round and then go from there. So, yeah, I, I like the shot on him. One huh? thing I missed in uh, the breakdown, BSD hasn't, he hasn't fought a southpaw yet. Interesting. And uh, like I was trying to look for tape on like BSD going up against a southpaw because one of his biggest weapons is the body kick. Like, BSD loves to spam a body kick, loves to spam a head kick. And honestly, he doesn't use his fists all that much. He just uses yeah. a lot of kicks uh, to try to push you off, blitz you, get, to, get you to the ground. Poirier is southpaw, so it's going to be southpaw and southpaw. The body kick's not going to be there. I would expect him to probably shoot it at the leg. Um, but if you're shooting at the leg, it opens you up to a left hand down the middle. Um, and then, obviously, Poirier's got some good leg kicks as well. So, yeah, it's, it's one of those where... It's it's gonna be fireworks, but yeah, you know, for a pick, I gotta go with my boy DP. Yeah, dude, it's. I mean, BSD um, gets hit too. That's another thing. Like Dustin's very accurate. BSD does get hit. It's very interesting. I cannot wait for this one. This is this is absolute fireworks, man. We move on to the main event. Sugar Sean O'Malley coming in as a minus two eighty favorite over Marlon Cheeto Vera sitting at plus two ten. The rematch. Everyone knows what happened in the first fight. Sean O'Malley gets his nerve shut off and his leg goes limp. And he loses via TKO round one. Years later, they meet for the title. Cheeto Vera, not like he really deserves this title shot, but it is the fight that probably makes the most sense for Sean O'Malley. And we get it here in the main event. Who do you got? Oh man, it's tough. It's hard to ignore plus 210 on a guy like Cheeto, like in any fight against anybody. Um, but the one thing I keep looking at is you watch their first fight, you watch what happened, and you look at their careers since then. I think Sean O'Malley has improved a lot more than Cheeto has. I think Cheeto's kind of that same fighter. He's got the same skill set and he kind of fights the same style. Uh, Sean has gone on to beat better fighters I mean, beating Piotr Jan close fight. Yeah. But I mean, that's it's Jan and he was able to have a lot of success in that fight. Um, he's holding the belt. Now he knocks out Aljamain Sterling. Uh, I just don't, I think Cheeto has got to hope to, um, you know, come out and steal at one or two round one or round two. Cause you know, Cheeto will win a round or two at the end, but he never seems to come out hot and really look to be aggressive early. But in this five round fight against Sean, you can't let Sean start fighting downhill. Like you got to get his respect right away because if not, he's going to easily win the first couple because he's long, because he uses his kicks well. Uh, he's very, very rangy and he's fast as hell. Uh, you know, Sean did kind of slow down against Piotr Jan later in that fight, which makes me think, you know, if, if Cheeto has the game plan to try to just extend this one, he could have some success late in the fight. Never really seen Sean O'Malley be knocked out with punches. Like we saw the leg kicks and the elbows, and that was the only really stoppage we have to go off of. And it is from Cheeto, but um, I don't know, man. I just don't. I don't. I don't think Cheeto has made massive improvements. I, I think that Sean will be the better striker here. I think Sean obviously is grappling and wrestling defense is probably underrated at this point. 
Um, so early, I think Sean wins the first two to three rounds, and then it'll get interesting after that. We'll see if he can kind of conserve some energy and not just look to start finishing him somewhere in the second or third. But yeah, for the pick, I'm going to take Sean O'Malley. I'm not betting him at this price, though. I think a dog shot on Cheeto is not a bad play considering like you're getting a top guy at plus 210 um, who has power and it's going to be a, a striking fight here. Um, but I'm just not confident really right now in him. What I've seen, um, you know, what Corey Sandhagen was able to do to him just makes me think that in this fight, regard like, you know, disregard the the first fight they had. If Sean doesn't get injured early, I, I think he has a lot of success against a guy like Cheeto. Yeah, I think if Cheeto wants to win this fight, he has to come out with an aggression yeah. to the point of a Marab Devalish really. Not, not, not shooting takedowns every five seconds, but he needs to be on Sean from the jump. Yep. If he does that, I think he's got a good chance. Um, but I don't I can't trust him to do that because he just never does it. He never right. does it. Like he's a guy that's relied on his durability throughout his career. He's never been knocked out, never been submitted, so he's never been finished. And he just relies on landed the more impactful shots um, and find and finishes when they present themselves. Now, if Sean O'Malley could stay safe, doesn't allow Cheeto to land anything big, um, I think he should probably cruise to a decision victory here because he lands 7.25 significant strikes per minute and only absorbs 3.51. So that lands twice as many significant strikes as he absorbs, more than that. And Cheeto Vera has a negative striking differential, 4.37 landed compared to 5.16 absorbed. That's never good to look at. And it's not like Cheeto's getting takedowns. L averages less than, or he averages 0.58 takedowns per 15 minutes. So he's not really going to be taking Sean to the ground. Um, I just don't see how on paper this fight plays out well for Cheeto. I think he's probably just going to get out volumed. Um, and it probably goes to a decision. Sugar does the the better work, and we get a an and still at the end of the night. Um, but the only thing that that scares me if is if Sean does start to fade later, or maybe the movement that he relies on early in the fight, in and out, very twitchy, starts to slow down. Cheeto can start to take over, maybe finds a late finish, or maybe he he turns it on on in round three and then wins the last three rounds. Uh, but I think Sean knows what's across from him he knows the the game plan or the style that cheeto vera is and he should be able to have a good game plan to counteract that and find a win um and sean it's not like he's chinny like he's not he's, he's been tested like we know what his chin is he got cracked by Piotr Jan. so if you get cracked by Piotr Jan, and it's, he didn't get knocked down like he got rocked but he didn't get knocked down and he was immediately like back into it. It's not like he he had to overcome anything big. Um, so I think if Cheeto even lands some pretty significant shots, Sean should be able to take it. So I'm on Sean. Don't love the price because uh, it's fairly chalky and, and it's a fight that probably going to go to a decision. And if you remember the Sandhagen fight, there was a judge <laughs> that scored it for Cheeto <laughs> Vera. Crazy. So if that, one of that stuff happens, like I. I yeah, I don't really want to be holding minus two eighty. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and with 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 Sean too, I, uh, people hate on him, and I think it's you know part of it he brings on himself on purpose with the hair, and you know he's gonna be wearing pink shorts. But I mean, he is tested. Like nobody can really say like, oh, he's getting layups for fights. Like he went and took Piotr Jan's best shots and beat him via decision. He went out under the bright lights on the big, biggest stage in the UFC, New York City, Madison Square, right? Or was that Boston? Boston. Where he beat Boston, but you know, he, he gets that pay-per-view spot against Aljo, um, looked nervous and he came out and he, he knocked him out in the second round while he was injured too. So, you know, he has the tough fights out of the way. He's got the big bright lights type of fights out of the way. And he's going to come out here against Cheeto, a guy he shared the octagon with before. Um, I think he can just finally come out here and fight. Uh, he's proved himself to be this caliber of fighter already. And he can just kind of you know, relax and have fun in there. So I, I think it's, I, I do think it is a Sean O'Malley win, um, but man, it, it's going to be a good fight. Here's some for you. And this is a great piece. Cheeto Vera's last five wins are all against fighters that are over or 35 or older. <laughs> so let me say that again. 
Cheeto Vera's last five wins are against fighters who are 35 or older. Pedro Munoz, Dominic Cruz, Rob Font, Frankie Edgar, and Davey Grant. That's crazy. All over 35 years old. And we know how that works out in those lower weight classes, all over 35. So, yeah, we'll leave you with that. I'm on Sean, and it uh, seems like you are too. So, yep. I think it could probably be like somewhat of a boring main event. Yeah. You know, just kind of a chess match type of thing. Um, I don't think it's going to be a war by any means, but, you know, maybe it could shock us. But I think Sean gets his hand raised again. That's the breakdown for UFC 299. Thank you for tuning in. Hit the uh, subscription button to uh, subscribe to the Home of Fight YouTube channel. We're here every week breaking down every card. And again, if you want in on all the bets, join Home of Fight Picks premium membership. You get both of our bets, the boy JJ's bets and the Parlay Kings, Derek Brunson's bets as well. We'll be there in attendance. If you see us there, give us a shout. Uh, don't be afraid. We'll say what's up because uh, we're only here because of you. We uh, appreciate all your support. Any last thoughts before we head out of here? Man, Miami card. The, these cards have a, a knack for being crazy and unpredictable. So yeah. I'm excited, man. It's going to be fun. Yeah, last one was pretty nuts too um, yeah. with uh, Adesanya K over Pereira. So maybe we see something crazy again. At HI Picks on the medias for me, I'll give out some free plays there on DFS. Where can they find you? All social medias at the Parlay MMA. Appreciate y'all. Till next time, the double egg signing out.